What's up, guys? Jake here, get Maxim failed 12. We're here, I guess, in the clock place, so let's let's do that then. The circular platforms both Odette and Ro were standing on begin rotating as they were raised above the court of fate. Upon reaching a certain height, they stop ascending. The layout of the upper area was similar to the lower stratum, but parts of it felt different somehow. The goddess, displaying her usual wry smile, had made her own ascent before either participant could blink. That's very fast. Do proceed! After ascending, all the cards in Odette's possession sprang out from her book at once. A strange light surrounded them, making both their number and contents from everyone's view except Odette's. So, uh, do I just say what info I have on him out loud? You wretched wrench! That's good alliteration there, my dude. Do as you please with the cards in your possession! Odette's eyes scan across the cards in front of her. She currently had nine cards, including her own. That's a lot! She's very good! Among them were three specific cards she needed to read out loud. She brushed her fingers against them before speaking. This is so dramatic. Oh, Jesus Christ. Ro Chan Ho! Please don't! I'm begging you! Cause of death! Stroke! You realize I have a family, don't you? How do you plan to account for them after killing me? Uh, they'll be fine. Who the fuck cares? Cease this nonsense now, and I can recompense you handsomely. Money, stocks, even land. You name it, I can provide it. Christ, you're pathetic. Please, I'll give you as much as you want. I'll even give you access to my credit details. You'll never have to work another day in your life. His regret was his dog. It's over. It's all over. Sorry. But you can't put a price on my life. And more importantly, when it comes to competitions, I'm always in it to win it. Oh, Jesus, that's so cringy. Once Odette finished, three of her cards flowed away from her. After reaching the middle of the Court of Fate, they came together and formed a triangle. Sorry, triangular shape. Not actually a triangle, but a shape that looked like a triangle. Nice knowing you, geezer. Who knows whether or not he could hear her last words to him. He simply hung his head in despair, realizing his fate had been sealed. One by one, Odette's cards began to emit a white light. May fortunes shine on the departed! Said light got brighter and brighter until eventually it blanketed the entire area. And then it happened. In the brief moment that Odette's vision was blinded by the light enveloping the area, her consciousness was overtaken by an unfamiliar scene. Her senses were linked to the scene as well. So sh for all intents and purposes, she was in this other scene that we're about to see, I hope. Oh, shit, a ceiling. How thrilling. She witnessed a number of old, chubby men, all wearing expensive suits and sitting in an oddly bright room. Their faces were all twisted expressions of boredom. The artificial lighting in the room was almost blinding when it reflected off the documents they'd brought along. It was apparent that they were holding some kind of meeting. She could tell it was one of great importance, judging by the tone of their voices and the fact that they were all bored as fuck. However, she was unable to hear the details of their conversation. Some manner of interference prevented her from doing so. And then the unexpected struck. All of a sudden, her vision went blurry. Next, her face slammed down on the table with a thud. Ow, that sucks. She was unable to muster the strength to move her body whatsoever. She collapsed down onto the floor. The unclear voices were now clearly being directed toward her. Eventually, her consciousness faded as she lost all bodily sensation. A stream of memories followed. All manner of people were talking to her, but it was impossible to make out a single word they were saying. Regardless, the sense of disconnect she felt at that moment made it clear what was going on. Ugh. Well said. Those were Rose memories. Memories of the moment he died, engraved upon his very soul. As he drew his last breath, Rose's thoughts were of his dog that died when he was young. Man, that sucks. It's too bad that he died. By the time the flashback ended, Rose disappeared from Odette's sight. The card she used to elect him did the same, and the room returned to its usual gloomy atmosphere. One thing she noticed was that the beam of light that had shone from above had grown thicker, although she wasn't sure whether or not it was just her imagination. So the electors are forced to experience the death of the elected, huh? You sure mess up in the head, aren't you? Heh. <laughs> Perka opted to respond with nothing beyond her wry smile, and heh. <laughs> in her hand were three cards. I didn't realize those were the cards that were in Rose's possession. Oh. Numero V's name, Numero 11's name, or Numero 11's cause of death? Which would you like? The platform on which Ode Odette stood began to move after Parka asked her question. Do take your time to think about it while we descend. Ain't much of a choice, is it? Well, she'd imagine this outcome. The fact that she was so on the memor- So on the money left her visibly annoyed. Following that, both her and Parker returned to the lower level of the Court of Fate. Are we gonna- Okay, it's a fucking cliffhanger. What card did she get? Well, well. I try to imagine everything she's just explained to me. Basically, you're forced to experience the same death as those you eliminate. Man, that's freaky. That Parker girl sure is cruel despite appearances. She's running a death game, like- Fucking obviously, right? 
You think? I found the whole thing pretty exciting. In response, I make sure to sigh loudly enough for her to hear it. She keeps babbling on without a care in the world, though. More importantly, we're heading to Japan next. Uh, might as well, considering we'll need to get there at some point. It's an especially good time to go now, what with that new card you got belonging to a Japanese guy and all. A super old guy at that! Yeah, let's head after we finish this grub. It finally feels like the second round's over now that we've decided our next move. Washing down the last flaky bits of my croissant with some milk, I stand up and get ready to leave. Fucking thrilling. You know she's gonna kill you, leprechaun guy, right? I hope you have a plan that doesn't suck. What is this? Oh, I'm back! I'm back! I'm Rinka again! Yay! Team Rinka! Go Rinka! Huff Huff. The morning brings memories of another nightmare with it. The second round divine selection has taken place. By this point, I've already accepted that I'm a participant. The fact that I'm alive right now makes it hard to comprehend the reality of my own death, but it's no longer about whether or not I believe it. Rather, the events that have taken place so far are starting to get to me, because they feel so detached from my own personal life. Divine Selection's grinding along, and two people have been eliminated without any influence from me whatsoever. I keep telling myself they had died over two weeks ago, but I can't forget the faces I saw in the Court of Fate. That alone is enough to make my heart ache. I... I don't want to die. Wow, novel. Not having access to my own cards is frustrating, too. There's one major reason behind my reluctance regarding all this, and it's the fact I don't know what my own regret is. I still haven't sorted things out with Maharu, but it's entirely possible we could both be eliminated while preoccupied with that. As, as afraid as I am of both the women from last night and the guy from the first round, not to mention everyone else, I'm not about to go down without a fight. My first and foremost priority. I have three cards at the moment. If I'm going to do any digging, I need to start with these three. I look up... Frederico Camerati, after I finish collecting my thoughts. Oh, it's the Leprechaun! We got Leprechaun Boy! Let's fucking kill him! He sucks! As expected, no useful information. All I learned is that it's a common name in Italy. Well, we tried. The other two cards provide me with a cause of death for numero number four, and regret for number nine. All I know about them is they seem to be foreigners. This game is heavily slanted in favor of older folks, right? Like, she's a high schooler. She doesn't have money to make international trips. Like, that's not fair. Where am I even meant to start? After a big sigh, I said about my morning routine. There's always the possibility the other participants don't know anything about me. No, there's not. Someone has your cards, right? Doesn't mean I can waste my time, though. My own card was among those distributed at the beginning, which means it's only a matter of time until someone puts two and two together. One thing that's me curious is number no four is cause of death. God, Roman numerals are hard. Much like me, their card says they died in a fire. From what I would crawl, number four is a boy from abroad. Of course, there's no guarantee he got caught up in the very same situation as me. Much like how there's no guarantee I simply died from the fire itself. In fact, I still don't recall how one broke out on the train in the first place. It was a bomb! There are plenty of possibilities, from a simple accident to an intentional terrorist attack. It was that one! But there's no way for me to find out when the act has been undone. In other words, all I've got going for me is my memory. Ah, fuck this. No point in forcing myself to try to remember. Especially when there's a near zero chance of a hint magically appearing to help me. I make my way downstairs, have some bread, and head to school. Yeah, it seems like we can put this whole thing on pause to go to school, right? This clock doesn't have hands. What the fuck time is it? Whew. Lunchtime at last! Did you bring your own? Mao and Maharu stroll over to my desk when the bell chimes for lunch. I plan on going to the cafeteria on my own, but Mao catches me just in time. We probably would have eaten separately if she hadn't, considering my mind is a little preoccupied with the whole murder thing. So much for trying to go about life as usual. Yeah, I was about to go over to the cafeteria or whatever. Actually, I overslept a bit this morning, so I didn't have time to make my own lunch. You overslept, huh? Pretty suspicious, did you murder anyone? Obviously, I won't ask if that was thanks to it being... to being in the dream world. Sure is rare for you to oversleep. Either way, full speed ahead to the cafeteria. This is the roof, you can't fucking trick me. The university on campus has its own cafeteria, which is apparently on the fucking roof. Middle schoolers aren't allowed to use it, but once you hit high school, it's fair game. Since it's a little awkward hanging around all the university students, most of us tend to buy our food and go eat it somewhere else. Oh, that's why we're on the roof. That goes double for us, considering how much we stand out. Yeah, three cute high school girls. Man, must be rough. Fuck you. That being the case, we make our way to the rooftop after getting our food. Oh, we've got it all to ourselves today. Oh, they weren't just lazy and drew no one else. The rooftop is, a, is usually crowded with students on days like this, but fortunately that doesn't seem to be the case today. What did you two get? A ham sandwich. It's simple, but it does the job. Not to mention it's nice and cheap. Don't you work for a living? What? Uh, you sure that's going to be enough? I can ask you the same. Yaki soba bread and, and pan isn't much more filling than what I have. Hey now, I got some coffee milk as well. So in terms of calories, I'm miles ahead of you. She jams the straw into the carton with a triumphant grin. It's a 16 ounce carton too. I'd probably struggle to finish it before lunchtime ends. Uh, why is calorie counting a competition now? Uh, to see who gains weight the fastest. 
Please find something better to compete in. It wouldn't hurt you to put on a little more weight. You know, I'd appreciate you not saying such things while ogling my chest, actually. Yowza. Much as I'm aware of my... depressing reality, I'd rather not have her remind me of it. Especially with Maharu standing right fucking there. What did you get, Rinka? A tonkatsu sandwich. Well, guess we got our winner. You're on the prowl for calories too, huh? Well, I'm certainly not competing over it, you fucking weirdo. Mao asks for a bite as I unwrap the packaging. Trust her to do so before I can get a bite in myself. I float the sandwich close to her mouth, which prompts her to chomp down on it. Aw, oh, I didn't get any of the tonkatsu from that bite. Sounds like a really shitty sandwich. You really take small bites, don't you? Wait, what's wrong, Muharu? She's staring at Mao with a blank expression. Well, um, maybe she wants a bite too. Want to trade it for your ham sandwich? I'll give you the part Mao didn't take a bite of. No, it's fine. I don't particularly like fried food in the first place. Fuck off. Everyone likes fried food. Please accept my humble apologies. This conversation is going nowhere fast. Mao presents her yakisoba bread as an offering to Maharu after apologizing. Unsurprisingly, Maharu turns her down, which elicits a laugh from her. Honestly, what a silly conversation. At the same time, it serves to remind me that moments like this are a regular part of my daily life. Thank you for explaining why the scene was here. I was at a loss. Rinka? What's up? Your name's not Rinka. Oh, sorry, I spaced out. I was thinking about life and murder and stuff. That's how I go back to eating my lunch. We keep chatting away as usual on the rooftop until it's just before lunchtime ends. Cool. Okay, lunchtime ended. Neat. After the final period of the day, here's someone call out to me as I'm tidying my desk. Rinka? Oh, son, Naomi. Turns out to be Naomi. Yeah, gathered, actually. The cultural festival isn't far off at this point, so it's about time she starts teaching her classmates to brew coffee themselves. That's why we made a deal to have her come over to Lion House as much as possible this week. She normally waits for me at the gate, so it's kind of surprising to see her come straight to my classroom. Now that I think about it, will everything I'm teaching Naomi right now be undone if I get eliminated? Yeah, that's the important thing. What if Naomi can't make coffee? Based on what Parker said, it's all but guaranteed. If that's true, why am I even bothering? Is something wrong? Oh, no. Just, no. no. I don't have anything to add to that. I can't keep acting like this. Mel caught me spacing out earlier today, too. Sorry for the wait. Let's, let's get out of here. Rinka? Maharu stops me as I'm standing up. What? Are you going home with her? I'm not cheating on you, baby. I would never. I just gotta teach this bitch how to make some coffee. Oh, hello. Yeah, she'll be practicing her brewing skills today. Uh, do you want to come? Yeah, obviously we invite Maharu, she's adorable. Do you want to come? Assuming you're free, obviously. Not like there'll be many customers in the first place, and I'm all for hanging out together and banging. I mean, just hanging out, making coffee, and nothing weird. Let's go. At first she looks happy about the offer, but it quickly shifts to disappointment. As much as I'd love to, I have work today. Why even give me the fucking option if she's not going to come anyways? Fuck you, Maharu. You're not invited anyways. But I might be able to get someone to fill in for me if I ask right now. She whips out her phone to check mid-sentence. No, no, no need to cancel work for this. All we'll do is chat anyway, so let's just do it later. Yeah, that sounds good. No take backsies, all right? Um, okay, that was weird. Not that I blame her. It's entirely possible one of us could be eliminated during the next round. I leave the classroom after saying goodbye to Maharu. Man, okay. What a stupid conversation. I'm sure Mal would have tagged along, but it seems like she's busy with something else today as well. Well, on our way to Lionhouse, Naomi blurts out something I didn't expect. I should apologize to her later. Oh, it's Maharu? Why? Well, it seemed like she wanted to talk to you about something in private. Oh, dude, she just wants the D, dude, or the V, or whatever I'm packing down there. You know what I'm saying? You know how it is. Maharu's just a thirsty bitch. It, it, it happens, you know? It's high school. Well, I wish she could have come. There's not much you can do about her having to go to work. Don't blame yourself. Th that's not what I meant, though. Oh, so what made you want to meet me in my classroom today? I figured it would be best to meet with you as soon as possible, but I'll make sure to wait for you from the gate from tomorrow on. What are you talking about? Naomi struggles to find words to answer my question. After a number of false starts, she simply tells me, Never mind! It's worth noting she actually seems a bit aggravated. A rarity for her. Didn't she die on the train with me? Am I remembering that wrong? Why isn't she in the death game? I don't know. I feel like she should be. Especially now that I know that we can actually see the other participants. Unbeknownst to both Rinka and Naomi, there's a girl secretly watching them from the school gate. Wow, way to ruin the tension. It was Maharu! Wow, what a twist! Known at Mecca High School for her looks and admission via scholarship. But we know Maharu. You don't have to introduce her, actually. To many, she's the embodiment of perfection. However, this perception has made her somewhat difficult to approach for them. 
Yeah, oh, it's so hard to be a perfect human. Fuck off. Especially now as tears stream out down her cheeks for all to see, except for the two who didn't see her. A scenario likely to become the focus, the locus of many rumors, excuse me, if it involves anyone other than Maharu. In fact, it's such an unusual sight, no one will dare mention it at all. Yo, Maharin, didn't think you'd still be here. I'm emotionally oblivious, and I don't see that you're crying right now. Amongst the crowd of students pretending they haven't seen anything, Aguma Mao is the only one to address her. Her attitude remains consistent, even in the presence of her friend crying without uttering a word. Maharu's focus never ships, shifts, despite Mao's presence. As such, Mao follows her line of sight, only to give a stage nod after seeing the two figures it led to. So that's what it is. Hey, Mao. Hmm. If I were to die, I'd have wanted to have been from earned Rinka's love. Okay. Okay, cool. So she's like... She's like there. That's that's her position. And like, on the one hand, obviously I called it. But on the other hand, it's still upsetting to me. Her voice quivers as she says this to Mao. Her words lack even the slightest hint of exaggeration. Mao is well aware that she simply has to let her true feelings slip out. Maharu's words fail to phase her. She responds as she always does. Fuck off, bitch. We have things to do. Well, guess you can't just die yet, then. I wonder what her regret is. She opts not to wait for Maharu's reply and walks off. Wow, what a good friend. She's like, hey, if I die, I want it to be from love. And she's like, okay, bitch. I, I don't have time for this. And just leaves. And not because she doesn't care. It seems like she doesn't care, though. She understands that Maharu sees no merit in sitting down to hash things out, or go and sing karaoke to shout out those inner feelings out loud. Come on, you don't want to dance your troubles away? Instead, she leaves Maharu to digest those simple words. Maharu doesn't think of Mao as being cold for doing so either, but we do. In fact, she feels absolutely nothing at all about her. Wow, okay, that's harsh. The only thing in her heart is Rinka, who gradually sinks into the horizon. Bitch, I invited you! Like, you could've come. This doesn't have to be an emotional moment. You were like, hey, can I come? And I was like, yeah, totally. And you were like, shit, I can't. And I'm like, okay, bye. Like, this wasn't a rejection. This is your fault. You could've quit work. Quit your job. You're gonna die, like, tomorrow anyways. Who the fuck even cares? I'm a little worried that we're gonna have kind of a, um, gas eye you know type situation where she's gonna just murder everyone. <laughs> Hello! You realize no one else works here, right? This is an empty room. Naomi drops her things off at the counter for donning the apron she's brought from home. That's adorable. I fill in the regulars about the cultural festival and tell them not to worry about Naomi's presence. In exchange for teaching her, she's offered to help out with dishwashing and other simple tasks for around an hour or so. I've told her not to bother, but she insists on it. It's gotten to the point where it'd feel rude to keep turning her down, so we've decided on a time for her to help me out. Here's the things typically go when Naomi's around. We open at 4 p.m. on weekdays. Wow, that is a cush schedule. And the hour or so after that, it's either completely dead or we have very few customers inside. That's when we either brew some coffee together or she reads up on the different types of coffee beans. The latter is more out of personal interest than anything else, since it won't come in handy for the cultural festival. Around 6 p.m., the regulars who are just finishing up work stop dropping by, so that's when I have her help out for an hour. Afterwards, she kills some time either studying or reading books. Sometimes we chat about the weather. That's how things went last week, anyway. Right, let's get down to business. To defeat the Huns?! She takes something out of her bag after I nod. It's a transparent plastic bag. Inside are a number of cookies made in the shapes of stars and hearts. Oh my goodness, Naomi is so adorable. Oh, these are cute. They're, um, they're my way of saying thanks. I made them at home yesterday. I untie the red ribbon as she hands me the bag. A sweet smell wafts through the room as soon as I do so. Watch out, it's poison. Would you like to have some together after we brew coffee? Uh, assuming you're fine with sweet things, of course. Oh, baby, you know how I like sweet things. Like you. Boop. I'd love to, thanks. I tie the bag back up to prevent the cookies from getting splashed with water while we're brewing. If only you could have moved them somewhere away from the sink, but hey. <laughs> I even made sure to use your favorite color for the ribbon. Huh? How'd you know that? My favorite color is red. Look at the things we learn. Wow, you actually thought I wouldn't have known? Leaving the cookie somewhere visible, I start the brewing process. Hey, bitch, I didn't know. Yep, you've got this down pretty well. You should be able to teach the others, no problem. No way! I'd much rather practice some more. This may be a method for beginners, but we know how clumsy I can be. She can act as humble as she wants, but it's a fact she's improving. I'm rather impressed by how well she manages it when she's properly focused. I wouldn't be surprised if she shot right ahead of me, if it were my grand teaching her. This feels like a good time for a break. I've been looking forward to those cookies years. Watch out, they're poisoned. We have no customers right now, so it's the perfect moment to take a break. Can't say for sure that's a good or bad thing, though. I place the cookies on a plate and carry them over to our usual seats with some coffee. After appreciating how great they look, I finally take a bite. <coughs> 
someone hits Naomi's panic button as she awaits my reaction. What the fuck? These... These are good. I'm not good at making dramatic reactions, so this is the best I can do. Naomi's eyes shimmer with an excitement that matches her beaming smile. This is not a beaming smile. That's a beaming smile! Oh, what a relief! I have a sip of my coffee before taking another bite. Oh, actually, is there poison in these? Is something the matter? These pair with coffee quite well, don't they? I'm struggling to find a reason why, though. Yes! I made them with extra butter so they would complement the bitter coffee you taste! She lets out another sigh of relief, brushing her hand down her chest. Oh, my. I'm so glad you like them! Jesus Christ! Like, I get it, Rinka's attractive, but damn, girls, keep it in your pants! There's no way I wouldn't when you went and made them for me. Ooh, you flirt. There are too many for me to eat alone, so we end up eating them together. Baking sweets is apparently one of her favorite pastimes. She can bake a whole bunch of things, but cookies seem to be her specialty. It reminds me that my grand used to bake cookies as well. Granted, the taste was completely different from these. These are simple and mellow, much like Naomi, but at the same time, they don't feel as if they were made by someone not used to baking. An idea hits me once we're about halfway through the plate. Would you mind teaching me how to bake these? Our customers would probably be thrilled to see more sweets on the menu. Learning directly from Naomi rather than trying to do so on my own is a much more realistic approach, too. Most importantly, I want our regulars to taste just how good these are. However, I can't help but remember divine selection when Naomi stares at me in utter amazement. Even if she does teach me, it'll all be for nothing if I get eliminated. I mean, everything will be for nothing if you get eliminated because you'll be fucking dead. But hey, why not? Eh, fuck it. Sorry I asked. There's no way I can tell her about the possibility of me dying, but I'm awfully close to doing so. I mean, if you die and time resets, the time's not really wasted, right? It gets blurred out of existence. There's definitely a part of me that figures I could list some of the weight off my shoulders if I told someone about all this. What, like Maharu? Who already knows? Well, why? Her overjoyed expression quickly clouds over as she draws her face curiously close to mine. I must look like I'm mulling something over, so I rush to find a way to respond. Uh, I can't keep taking up your time like this, murder game, death game. I'm gonna die tomorrow, so whatever. That's not what you're really thinking, though, is it? Huh? Besides, I'm the one who asked you to teach me first. That end well, um, you know, well, we can fuck. She struggles a bit for continuing. Sorry, I'm just, uh, I'm not sure how to put this. Don't worry about it, just put it away, you know? I want us to keep spending time together. Her eyes immediately shoot to the floor, almost as if she's let the words fall out by accident. S sorry something about me has been strange lately you might just be tired after i made you do stuff you're not used to do you want to head home for today or hey maybe have a cup of coffee that, that's not it she takes a small breath raises her head back up and looks me dead in the eyes her expression is almost oppressive uh, forgive me but for asking this out of the blue but uh, could you hear me out for a moment and before we hear her out I'm going to draw this episode to a close. So thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you liked that, don't forget to like and subscribe. Be sure to tune next week for more Fatal 12 with yours truly. I'll see you guys then.